The skull was split in half, most likely with a lightweight axe or quite possibly a cleaver. Cut marks crisscrossing the head and jaw of the girl indicate her flesh, tongue, and brains were removed from the skull. A 14-year-old girl butchered like an animal in the heart of what will become America. And this isn't some horror movie plot. This is Jamestown, Virginia, 1609. The settlers called it the Starving Time, and boy, did that name fit. They ate horses, dogs, rats, anything they could get their hands on. But when even the leather from their shoes ran out, they turned to the unthinkable. They turned on each other. For centuries, it was just a rumor, a dark whisper about the early days of America. But in 2013, archaeologists dug up the truth. They found James's bones in a trash pit, bearing the unmistakable signs of cannibalism. Now, you might be thinking, surely this was a one time thing, right? Just a moment of madness in extreme circumstances. Well, hang on to that thought because we're about to dive into a story that will make you question everything you thought you knew about the civilized world. Jamestown was supposed to be the jewel in England's colonial crown. Instead, it became a death trap. In just two years from 1607 to 1609, 80% of the settlers were dead. Picture yourself there. You're stuck in a flimsy wooden fort surrounded by a wilderness you don't understand. Your supply ship is late and the natives aren't exactly rolling out the welcome mat. As winter sets in, your food stores dwindle to nothing. What do you do? A report from 1624 paints a grim picture. Settlers eating, quote, hogs, dogs, and horses that were in the colony, together with rats, mice, snakes, or what vermin or what else we found growing upon the ground that we could fill either mouth or belly, unquote. Historian James Horn says, quote, the English would have only resorted to cannibalism under the most severe circumstances, unquote. But here's where it gets interesting, and by interesting, I mean deeply hypocritical. While Europeans were busy pointing fingers at savage cultures for cannibalism, they had their own skeletons in the closet. And I mean that literally. In 11th century England, human flesh was sold in markets during famines. Let that sink in. Centuries before Jamestown, Europeans were buying and selling human meat like it was just another cut at the butchers. But wait, there's more. In the 16th century, cannibalism got a fancy rebrand. Suddenly, it wasn't barbaric, it was medicine. Got a headache? Try some powdered skull. Feeling under the weather? How about a nice blood tonic? This wasn't some fringe practice either. It was mainstream medicine endorsed by the upper crust of society. So here's the kicker. While Europeans were chowing down on human remains for health reasons, they were using accusations of cannibalism to justify conquering the new world. It's like accusing your neighbor of stealing while you're burglarizing their house. But let's rewind a bit. How did Jamestown end up in this mess? It all started on December 20th, 1606. When three ships, the Susan Constant, the Godspeed, and the Discovery set sail from England, funded by the Virginia Company. These weren't just explorers, they were investors looking to strike it rich in the new world. The voyage was a nightmare. Imagine being crammed into a wooden ship smaller than a tennis court. Surrounded by the constant creaking of timber, the stench of unwashed bodies, and the ever-present smell of moldy provisions. The salty sea spray stung the faces of weary sailors as the ships pitched and rolled over troubled waters. When they finally arrived on April 26, 1607, they picked a spot along the James River to set up shop. Strategic? Maybe. Habitable? Not so much. The place was a marshy, mosquito-infested swamp with no fresh water. Setting up camp was no picnic either. These settlers, already weakened by their long voyage, now faced back-breaking labor under the relentless sun. The air was thick with the scent of freshly cut timber mingling with the more pungent smells of sweat and illness. The sound of hammers and saws echoed through the forest as they hastily constructed a triangular fort. They were building more than just shelters. They were laying the foundation for what they hoped would be a new empire. But the settlers' troubles were just beginning. Their relationship with the local Powhatan tribe was complicated, to say the least. George Percy, an early settler, recounted one of their first encounters on May 18, 1607, when he said, quote, At night, when we were going aboard, there came the savages creeping upon all fours from the hills like bears with their bowls in their mouths, who charged us very desperately in the faces, hurt Captain Gabriel Archer in both his hands, and a sailor in two places of the body. Very dangerous, unquote. Now let's pause for a second because this is all from the English perspective. To the Native Americans, though, these settlers weren't pioneers, they were invaders. The settlers' accounts often depict indigenous people as hostile and savage. Now let's talk about the elephant in the room. 
racism. The word savage wasn't just a casual insult. It was the cornerstone of a deeply ingrained white supremacist ideology. When colonists called Native Americans savages, they weren't just being rude. They were constructing a worldview that placed white Europeans at the top and everyone else at the bottom. Think about it. How convenient is it that the people that you're displacing and killing just happen to be uncivilized savages? It's a narrative that justifies theft, murder, and genocide. But despite the initial violence, the settlers pushed on. Percy noted another encounter, quote, We marched to those smokes and found that the savages had been there burning down the grass, as we thought, either to make their plantation there or else to give signs to bring their forces, unquote. But it wasn't all warfare and suspicion. At Cape Comfort, the settlers had a different kind of welcome. Percy wrote, quote, The captain called to them in sign of friendship, but they were at first very timorous until they saw the captain lay his hand on his heart. Upon that, they laid down their bows and arrows and came very boldly to us making signs to come ashore to their town, unquote. As Jamestown grew, so did the tensions. The English proved to be terrible neighbors. They encroached on native lands, segregating the indigenous people from white settlements and systemically destroyed their long houses and canoes. They stole corn and desecrated sacred sites. As the settlement expanded and more colonists arrived, the demand for land and resources grew. And by 1622, it was clear to the Native Americans that peaceful coexistence wasn't on the menu. Gabriel Tayak, a Native American historian puts it bluntly when she says, quote, 400 years ago on the land that we now know as Virginia, a foreign force catastrophically and irrevocably changed the lives of thousands of people who had been living on American soil since time immemorial. The consequences for my Piscataway Indian ancestors who were among those who lost all of their land, their traditional culture, and even most of their lives within a few decades of Jamestown's establishment were disastrous, unquote. But here's the kicker. While the English were busy seeing demons at every turn, the real enemy was something much smaller and far more deadly. The summer ended in 1607, a silent killer emerged from the swamps. Mosquitoes, carriers of malaria, began to decimate the colony. These tiny vampires didn't care about empires or religion. They were equal opportunity killers, turning the colonists' grand ambitions into a fight for survival. With fewer than 50 men left standing by the end of that first summer, Jamestown was teetering on the brink of becoming a ghost town before it had even really begun. Each night as the mosquitoes hummed their deadly lullaby, the duty officer would recite a prayer. But it wasn't just a plea for protection against the wilderness or the native peoples, no. These prayer warriors saw themselves locked in a cosmic battle. In their minds, the Native Americans weren't just hostile neighbors, they were agents of Satan himself sent to destroy this budding Christian civilization. And let's not forget the Spanish in this story. In the paranoid minds of the English settlers, those Catholic conquistadors who had already been there for dozens of years were just waiting for the right moment to swoop in and extend Europe's religious conflicts to Virginia. Talk about fighting ghosts. The Spanish threat was more imaginary than real, but it kept the colonists up at night all the same. But the story of Jamestown isn't just about conflict between settlers and natives or about the struggle against nature. It's also the birth of another American tragedy. On August 20th, 1619, a ship called the White Lion arrived in Jamestown carrying, quote, 20 and odd Negroes from Angola. This marked the beginning of slavery in English North America. Among them were Antony and Isabella, whose child William Tucker became the first documented African baby born in the colony in 1624. But let's not kid ourselves. This wasn't the first attempt at colonization, nor was it the first time Europeans brought enslaved Africans to the Americas. Nearly a century earlier, in 1526, the Spanish had established a colony called San Miguel de Guadalupe in what is now Georgia. And guess what? They brought enslaved Africans with them. That colony lasted all of about three months before collapsing with the enslaved Africans revolting and reportedly joining local Native American tribes. And let's not forget that mysterious lost colony of Roanoke, established in 1585, just a stone's throw away from Jamestown. They vanished without a trace, leaving behind only the cryptic word Croatoan carved into a post. But let's go back to Jamestown and its 20 and odd Negroes. These weren't just nameless victims of history. They came from the kingdom of Ndongo, present day Angola a place with its own rich history and fierce resistance to European encroachment. In the past, I've talked about Queen Zinga of Ndongo, a 17th century African ruler who fought against Portuguese colonization. These enslaved people brought to Jamestown, they were her people. 
At first, these Africans were treated similarly to white indentured servants, indentured servants being people who worked for a set number of years, usually four to seven in exchange for passage to the new world room and board. And the transition from indentured servitude to chattel slavery didn't happen overnight. It was a slow, insidious process. At first, some Africans like Anthony Johnson even gained their freedom and became landowners. But by the 1640s, the first laws specifically targeting Negroes began to appear. And then we see the first legal distinction between African and European servants in a Virginia court case. In 1662, Virginia passed a law stating that the status of the child followed the status of the mother, effectively ensuring that children of enslaved women would be born into slavery. In 1705, the Virginia House of Burgess has passed a series of laws known as the Virginia Slave Codes, which stripped away any remaining ambiguity about the status of enslaved Africans. Enslaved Africans were now property, not people. They could be bought, sold, traded, and passed down as inheritance. And this wasn't just a moral failing. It was the beginning of a system that would shape America's economy, politics, and social structure for centuries to come. It was a deliberate dehumanization of an entire race. The colonists created an entire pseudoscience to justify it. They measured skulls, compared skin tones, and wrote lengthy treatises on the supposed inferiority of black people. And I want you to ask yourself, what kind of mental gymnastics does it take to look at another human being and decide they're not human at all? How do you square that with claims of Christian morality or enlightenment ideals? The colonists described enslaved Africans as property in their laws and beasts in their personal writings. They separated families, tortured rebels, and raped women, all while maintaining their self-image as civilized Christians. This wasn't just the actions of a few bad apples. This was a systemic institutional racism that permeated every aspect of colonial life. It was written into laws, preached from pulpits, and taught to children. Because here's the thing, Jamestown isn't just the birthplace of America, it's the birthplace of American racism. So as we wrap this up, what does this all mean? It means that Jamestown isn't just a story of starving colonists. It's a reminder of how thin the veneer of civilization really is. It's about the stories we tell ourselves to justify our actions and the harsh realities we'd rather forget.